this is an American problem and not just a black problem or a brown problem or a Native American problem. This is an American problem. When anybody in this country is not being treated equally under the law, that's a problem. Protests continue across America after two white police officers go uncharged in the deaths of two unarmed black men who are suspects in crimes. Fifty years after the U.S. outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, is the U.S. justice system still biased against people of color? Hello, I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C., and this is The Heat. One hundred and fifty years after the Emancipation Proclamation freed blacks from slavery, does the U.S. treat blacks as equals under the law? In 2011, the U.S. judicial system had more black Americans imprisoned or under the watch than were enslaved here back in 1850. And then there's this. One out of every three black American males born today can expect to go to prison. So when a young unarmed robbery suspect named Michael Brown was shot by a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, and another, Eric Garner, accused of selling cigarettes on a New York City street, died after being put in what appeared to be a chokehold by police, the black community was outraged. Add to that a judicial system that declined to charge either police officer with their debts, and you have a climate ripe for anger and dissent. Later, we'll talk about the racial divide in America with a leading scholar, radio talk show host and activist, and one of the nation's leading attorneys. But first, some background on a judicial process that many black and white Americans believe failed from CCTV's Jim Spellman. And Jim, in both instances, charges were not brought by a grand jury. Explain to us what a grand jury is. Hey there, Anand. When prosecutors believe a serious crime, a felony, has been committed, a grand jury is used to determine if there's enough evidence to go forward with a trial. The federal government and about half of the 50 U.S. states use grand juries on a regular basis. They generally consist of about 23 people, and they will hear only evidence the prosecutor chooses to, to present to them. There's no judge and no attorney representing the accused. In fact, sometimes the person accused of a crime doesn't even know the grand jury is hearing evidence about them. The proceedings are generally kept secret, and if the grand jury feels there is enough evidence, they vote for an indictment and the case then moves forward. And Jim, who sits on these grand juries? These are regular citizens. They're chosen from the same pool that makes up trial juries. Typical grand juries convene for months at a time, but they only meet occasionally, and they typically decide on many cases in that time. And you mentioned the other jury as well, the trial jury. How is a grand jury different from a trial jury? So a grand jury is larger than a trial jury, which typically only has 12 people. And the standard of proof is much different for grand juries. A trial jury in a criminal case needs to find a defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But a grand jury simply needs to determine that there is probable cause to proceed to trial. And a trial jury needs to make a unanimous decision, but a grand jury typically only needs a majority of the jurors for an indictment. It's considered very easy for prosecutors to convince a grand jury. In fact, a New York judge once said that a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich, meaning almost anything a prosecutor wants, they'll get from a grand jury. And we're looking at these cases now where it's, there's so much anger about these two police officers not being indicted. Why is it so hard to indict police officers? Well, first off, police officers have different responsibilities and therefore different rights than regular citizens when they're performing their duties. Many of the things they do, from speeding in their police cars to handcuffing criminals to using their weapons, would be illegal if a civilian did them. So police automatically have what's called qualified immunity. Often in cases involving police officers, the grand jury is deciding if a crime has been committed at all. This was the case in Ferguson and Staten Island. And remember, these grand jurors aren't trained legal professionals. They may not fully understand the law or the fine distinctions involved in something like a police shooting. Plus, there are fears that prosecutors could manipulate the grand jury away from indicting police officers by presenting confusing or overwhelming evidence without a lawyer to represent the victim or even a judge present, prosecutors have a huge amount of power in the process. Critics of the decision in Ferguson have charged that this is what prosecutors in that case may have done. Usually, the police and the prosecutors work hand in hand putting a case together against a civilian. In the case of potential police misconduct, it's not clear that the prosecutor is going to be in a position to aggressively stand up for the victim. 
Critics of the process say that police prosecutors are too close to each other, and there's no one in the whole grand jury system advocating for the victims, Anand. And does all of this make the grand jury system open to racial bias? Well, that's certainly what critics uh, are saying in the wake of these two high-profile cases, but it's really hard to say because the process is so secretive and one-sided. Keep this in mind. Grand jurors are not screened for biases the way they generally are for trials. So any biases or prejudices they may have, racial prejudices, biases for or against police, all of that they bring with them to the grand jury. That's how the system works. Originally, grand juries were seen as a layer of protection between citizens and the government, but now to many critics of this system, it looks more like a layer of protection for the police, Anand. Thanks, Jim. That's CCTV's Jim Spellman reporting there.